please, to Isaiah chapter 5. Isaiah chapter 5 in our series on Isaiah. We're not very far in yet. We're only five chapters or four chapters, five, Lord willing, by the end of tonight. And a long way to go. And sometimes when you read in the prophets, the major prophets, Isaiah, or maybe one of the minor prophets, one of the smaller books toward the end of the of the Old Testament. Perhaps you've read these in your personal devotion time, and I hope you read or spend time with God every single day. Read it, listen to it, get the Word of God inside of you every single day of the week, all right? Just because you come to church does not replace your walk with God. But perhaps you've been uh, in your time with God in the morning or evening, and you've come to the, pro- to the prophecies, and maybe as you hear what's going on, perhaps you would find yourself kind of like a third-party observer, where you maybe read what God is saying, but you're kind of removed from the conversation. Because what God is saying is directed specifically here at the children of Israel in this passage. And it's easy, it is easy, I find it easy, I find others see it easy to easily set aside what God says as if it were just meant for someone else as if it were meant just for the Israelites back then because, my goodness, they had problems. Or for the people around us in the auditorium because, my goodness, they have problems. Or even worse, to let the Word of God just fall on deaf ears because that's what we're supposed to do, come to church and listen to somebody speak about the Bible and just ignore it. And you see what we ought to do when we come to these prophecies to see what God is saying, understand what God is saying, and then as we hear it, to pause, hit the pause button on life, and reevaluate life's choices. There are sometimes that phrase is used in a humorous sense. Somebody can wear something you're like, boy, are you sure you're comfortable wearing that? You ought to reevaluate your life choices. But it is no laughing matter when we come to the Word of God and are confronted with the Word of God. We ought to every time the Word of God is presented in our life, whether we're reading it, listening to it, daily or in church, in a corporate setting, we ought to pause and reevaluate life's choices. Amen? It's not just meant to fill our head because as we learned this morning, head knowledge is dead knowledge. We're supposed to touch our heart. But why is it? Why is it so easy to pass over God's decrees and criticisms and judgments? Anybody else find it easy to do? And justify our own behavior? Why is, it that, why is that so easy? In contrast, if someone, if some person criticizes or insults you, you can remember that till, till, your, till your dying day. Why is it that, that I can remember in high school when Sean, who sat next to me, ridiculed the pair of pants I was wearing? I still remember to this day. Why can I still remember that, yet I can quickly set aside the truth from the Word of God that wants to influence me in such a better way? Sean was looking for a laugh. God is looking for a life change. Yet why is it we can easily set aside the truth from the Word of God? Are you with me so far? You hear what I'm saying? We can set that aside, but if someone passes you in the hallway and doesn't look at you, you hold on to that. Why can we so quickly analyze that and set aside the truth from the Word of God? You can remember from high school, grievances and offenses. You can remember from your spouse, criticisms and things they said in in jest or in hurt. And yet when we come to the Word of God, it is with alarming ease that we set God's Word aside in our life to place of just convenience and non-effect. And we do that to our own shame. In comparison, we ought to, to clearly grasp what God says much more deeply, much more intimately than something anyone else says. It ought to be that we could still remember, I remember the night that God touched me here and God changed me here and the word of God touched me here. And I'm sure that most of us can remember some of those, but I think you understand what I'm saying, that most of us can remember what a human says far quicker, and it's far more emotional than what God says. And tonight as we approach Isaiah chapter 5, God is going to speak in, in some simple ways. He kind of turned this message according to the, the word of God differently than I had intended. But in Isaiah chapter 5, God sets down some pretty stout, has a pretty stout conversation with, with Israel. It's a pretty heavy conversation if this was a human interaction, 
this would be a lecture from a parent to a child. And it would be one of those conversations, uh, Brother Treadway, I'm sure you've had these, uh, where, where it's not a conversation. You're not looking for a two-way communication. You're looking to impart some truth and for the child to receive the truth. I'm not looking for their opinion. Now, other times we have conversations, right? Other times you're like, hey, let's dialogue. But there are sometimes parents, dads, moms, you know what I'm talking about, teachers, principal, principal. There are sometimes, and listen, this is not a conversation, all right? I'm going to give you some truth, and you need to take it in. And it needs to touch you. Or some of you parents are like, if it doesn't touch you, then something else will touch you. And here God has one of those conversations with his children. Beginning of the chapter, we find that that uh, um, God is, is speaking to the well-beloved. All right, it is those who are deeply loved by the Father. And everyone who is saved is deeply loved by the Father. Now, we know that the whole world is loved. John three sixteen tells us that. But those who became the sons of God, the children of God, have a special relationship with the Father. And here the verbiage in, in verse number one and in verse number two, talking about the vineyard and the choicest vine and, and God's vine, there's some, uh, some, uh, some analogy there, some picture language for us. The God is saying, this is a beautiful thing that I've done. I've chosen you and, 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 I, and I loved you and I've treated you well. I've caused you to prosper. I've blessed you. And you've not responded the right way. And it would be easy to set that aside. To look at the children of Israel and say, oh my, my, oh my. Can you believe the children of Israel would do that to God? Can you believe that they would accept his blessings and accept his love and accept his prosperity and then push him aside? Can you believe they would do that? I'm glad I would never do that. I'm glad I would never take the blessings of God and, and take them for granted. Prayer, salvation, Grace, forgiveness, mercy, all right? And the, the things that we're touched with every single day. I'm glad I would never, and you would never set that aside. Boy, the children of Israel, they were some bad people. Yet that language gives to us not just children of Israel, but to you and I, because the Bible is often given in layers, specifically to those who hear it then, but across the portals of time and the, and the halls of time, it's for you and for me to hear and to heed. I want you to look at one verse in particular as kind of the, the turning point in this passage. It's found midway throughout the chapter in verse number 24. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble, and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be as rottenness, and their blossoms shall go up as dust. Because they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. I have two different titles for this message tonight. One is, are you just a dust plant? Are you just a dust plant? See, dust in the house is never pleasant. You ladies will... Have someone come over and you look around your house like, oh my goodness, there's dust everywhere. And so you quickly grab a duster or a rag or a child and say, listen, dust the living room, dust the table, get rid of the dust because dust is not attractive in, in our minds. No one says, boy, you know what, this is a great day, my house is full of dust. No one says, man, it was great breathing outside, why? The dust was so heavy in the air, I just brought it in, oh, it was so good. No, we're like, man, I can't breathe. It's obnoxious. It's tedious to clean up. All right, it's worrisome and bothersome. And it's not a sign of prosperity, but of dearth, of deadness. All right, dust does not come, all right, as something blossoms. It comes from something that is decaying. You don't say, wow, look at my new dust plant. Aren't these dust flowers beautiful? I mean, just look, blow on it, and dust just billows out. 
Would you like one for your birthday too? No, of course not. Yet here the Bible says that because they cast away the word of the Lord and the holy word of, of Israel, the holy word of God, that their blossoms, their prosperity, their life success became as dust. Or all they did merely manufactured decay. They were a dust plant. So tonight, the first title for the message is, Are You Nothing But a Dust Plant? How shameful it would be if God has touched us so much and loved on us and been so gracious and in response and in return, we merely manufacture dust. So let's ask the Lord's blessing and then we'll jump inside what they were doing and ask God's help. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us. Lord, I pray you'd guide uh, this sermon, that it would be true to your word, to you. And Lord, you challenge our hearts, our spirit, that your, your spirit would communicate with our spirit. And if there's an area or areas that are displeasing to you, Lord, that we would respond in humility and repentance. Lord, thank you for your compassion. Thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, thank you for the chance we had to sing tonight in worship uh, of just your greatness and your goodness. Lord, we pray now that you touch us again. Lord, help us not to leave hardened, but to leave soft to you. Lord, we love you. We'll give you the praise and the glory. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. The Bible says in verse number 24 that there were two particular actions, two grouping of actions that happened in order to become a, a dust plant. The Bible uses this word that they, they cast away. They cast away the law of the Lord of hosts. Now that was speaking to specifically uh, the law of God found in Deuteronomy and found some in Leviticus. We find the law of God where God laid out some laws. Now, now with the full canon of Scripture complete, the whole Bible could be considered the law of God. And what the children of Israel had done, apparently what God is saying, that they had cast it away. They had despised it. The word here has the idea that you turn your nose up at it, that you take a, a whiff of it, and you're like, ooh, I don't like that. Now, maybe you've gone to a restaurant where they've had some different food that you're not used to. And someone has said, hey, try this dish. Perhaps at a Chinese restaurant, try the little octopus. And you take a whiff of it, and you're like, ooh, I don't want to try that. You disdain, you cast it. Like this word says, you cast it away. My wife is German. Her family is, uh, is first-generation German. Her first language is, is German. Her mother came over on a boat uh, to Ellis Island. And so, I mean, they are, they are German as German can be. Her father since passed to be with the Lord eight years now or so, maybe about ten. Um, I remember one of the first times, their first Christmas is there, her mother was so excited to make me just a delicious German dish. Now, there are many German dishes I love. I love bratwurst. I love sauerkraut. I love those things. But this one, this one, not so much. It consists of three common ingredients. Steak, hamburger, I'm sorry, steak, um, eggs, and onion. Which, on a, one level, would not be a bad idea. Except that the steak is ground up into like hamburger-looking things, and it is used raw. The egg is cracked into the ground-up raw meat, also raw, and the onion is then put in raw as well. Honey, have I missed anything yet? And here I am now. I grew up in a family, thanks a lot, Dad, uh, where my parents taught me to try everything, which is not a bad lesson in life. We've actually taught our kids the same thing. So here I am with, this, uh, with my mother-in-law, or not mother-in-law yet, I don't think, but just I mean, she's excited, and Dad's excited, Doreen's excited, her twin sister Karen's excited, and I'm not excited. <laughs> Trying to deal with this particular dish. And, um, <laughs> and I'm like, oh my goodness. The, the German name is, is Huckfleisch, is the name of the dish, Huck, Huck, Huckfleisch. I'm looking at this dish, and uh, uh, her mother's like, oh, JD, you should try this. And I'm like, oh, I had this last week. <laughs> and uh, you, this is like, like a little just like, uh, look into JD's heart and life that if I'm really, really nervous, laughter and jokes really come out. All right, it's my way to deal with that kind of stress. I'm looking at this dish like, this is a recipe to die. Raw steak, raw eggs, 
Raw onion. I'm dying. <laughs> She's like, I've, had, I've had this last week. She's like, oh, you have had it last week? I said, yeah. I put in a pan and fried and called it a hamburger. <laughs> go with it here. And there I was, looking at that dish, and there was no way that I could feasibly turn up my nose at this dish and not offend, you know, Doreen or her family and her sister. So I, with all the grace that God gives in life, took a small spoonful and ate it uh, and, and decided that I am not German. <laughs> I'm Puerto Rican. And we cook food. We put it in a pan, fry it, called hamburger, but we told you this huckfleisch. What the children of Israel had done is they had looked at what God had offered through his law and turned up their nose. I don't like that. I don't think that's appealing to me in my life. I don't think I want to ingest that. I'm going to despise it. Turn up my nose, or like the Bible says in verse 24, cast away the law of God. My friend, understand that any time that we turn up our nose at the law of God, that we are in a dangerous place in life. That we are in danger of becoming a dust plant. When we look at the law of God, what God says, and say, I don't think I'll ingest that today. I don't think I'll apply that to my life. I don't think I'll take that in. I see what you're serving. Lord, I, I see what you're saying, but, but I don't want to have it right here. Not only did they cast away, the Bible says, but it uses this word, they despised the word of the Holy One of Israel. This idea right here is that they had not only despised the written word, but the holy word here gives us the, the idea that everything that the prophets were saying, and they were saying from the Lord, thus saith the Lord, they, they were giving God's word, that not only had they despised and cast away the written word, but the spoken word, the word from the prophets, they had also blasphemed. Now we know as we read the accounts of the prophets through Isaiah and Jeremiah and Malachi, these different prophets, and find out in Hebrews chapter 11 how they treated the prophets, that they blasphemed the word of the prophets. Jeremiah had written down the word and, and they destroyed, they destroyed what Jeremiah had put down. And so not only had they turned their nose up at, at the written word of God, when the prophets spoke, they also said, you know what? That's ridiculous. Or Mr. Prophet shut your mouth. We don't want to hear it. We don't want to hear it. We're content with our own way and our own things. You see, my friends, we become a dust plant when we don't allow God's word to touch us. But where I want to sit tonight is not in what happens, but how they got there. And if you look back, beginning in verse number 8, because in verses 8, 8 through verse number 23, we find six sins, six woe, woe unto them, six woes, six sins that you and I can still be guilty of today. Six sins, all right, that will turn your life into a manufacturer of dust, that will turn your actions into worthless, decaying rottenness. And as we look at these sins briefly tonight, I want you to ask yourself and ask the Lord, Lord, is this true in my life? Because where we began the night was this thought. It is so easy to take God's word and set it aside and take his criticism and put it aside. But man's word, they, their insults, their complaints, we internalize very quickly. And tonight, let's internalize God's word. Let's look first of all, the first thing that God says that the children of Israel did, but you and I can still be guilty of, beginning in verse number eight, where the Bible says this, woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place, that they may be placed alone in the midst of the earth. In mine ears, saith the Lord of hosts, of a truth many houses shall be desolate, even great and fair, without inhabitant. Yea, ten acres of vineyard shall yield one bath, and the seed of an homer shall yield an ephath. And what the Bible is saying here, to kind of explain the, the verbiage here, is that the children of Israel were guilty of one particular sin in this passage, and it's the sin of covetousness. 
The words there with the house to house till there's no room shows the idea that they're trying to accumulate as much as they possibly can until there's no more space to get anything else. In a modern vernacular, it'd be saying that my house is crammed from floor to ceiling with stuff. And I'm still not content. And the sin of covetousness had crept into the house of Israel. To covet is to crave, to lust after anything that you don't have. It's not just a house. It's not just a land. It is anything that we don't have. If we begin to crave it, then we are covetous. It is the opposite of contentment. And the Bible says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you satisfied or are you a covet? Now, we don't like to answer the question that way. We don't necessarily want to say we're satisfied, but we definitely don't want to say that we covet because coveting is a bad thing. Yet the Bible says you're either content or you're not. There's no middle ground. I read a story about a preacher in this particular thought of covetousness and, and had some similar ideas about it. In his story, he talked about how he learned about covetousness in high school when he took a bologna sandwich to school every day. And that was the lunch of our choice growing up, and uh, we had bologna sandwiches most days. And he talked about how he sat next to Randy at school, this preacher and Randy. Randy didn't bring a bologna sandwich. Randy got the hot lunch every single day. And this man said, he goes, I sat there eating my bologna sandwich on white bread while Randy smacked down his hot lunch every single day. He went on to say this. He said, you know, I learned in the Ten Commandments about coveting. Well, you shouldn't cover a house, you shouldn't cover a house or a land or a, a neighbor's wife or an ox or a donkey or a servant. And he said, you know what, I had no problem with another person's house. And no problem with the wife. I was, I was in high school, grade school. I had no problem with an ox or donkey. I was fine. But I wasn't fine with my lunch. And I wonder, my friend, fellow Christian, how we can easily set aside the ox and donkey. Because to be quite, quite, quite frank, I don't want an ox or donkey at my house. My wife may. <laughs> I don't have a problem coveting an ox or donkey. I don't want your property. I don't want your house. Don't want your wife. But if we're going to be honest tonight, we ought to ask ourselves, God, is an area in my life where I do covet? Maybe you want a different job. And you're like, why did they get that job and that position? I deserve it. Covetous. Maybe it's some particular talent. Why do they have that talent? Or worse yet, for your kids. Why is that kid able to do that and my kid can't? You see, it's not the ox or the donkey that gets us. It's the bologna sandwich. It's what we have and wishing for what we don't have. That is covetousness. And Paul said this. He said, I've learned how to abound, have a bunch, and I've learned how to have nothing. But I've learned this one thing, that in whatsoever state I am, that I will be content. And contentment is not merely acceptance. Oh, this is my lot in life. This is what I'm stuck with. No, contentment says, God, thank you. I embrace what you gave me. This job you gave me that has longer hours than that job, thank you. Thank you. And why is it that the devil can turn anything into something we want to covet? It can be a simple blessing that someone else receives, and then in our minds we begin to think, well, why didn't I get that blessing? Covetousness. And it may not be the ox, and it may not be the donkey, but it might just be the bologna sandwich. And the minute we begin to covet, my friends, we begin to manufacture dust. Because as we covet, we start to accumulate all things that are worthless, 
all things that will decay and have no value. And God says, listen, it is time to set aside covetousness and to repent and come back to me. Well, he could stop right there when we could have the song play, I Surrender All, and many of us ought to be at the altar. But there are six things in this passage. That's just number one. Let's move on to number two. Beginning in verse number 11. The Bible says this, Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink and continue until night, till wine inflame them, and the harp and the veil and the tabret and the pipe and wine are in their feasts. But they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of his hands. Therefore, my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge, and their honorable men are famished, and their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore, hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory, and their multitude, and their pomp, and he that rejoices shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, and the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment, and God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner, and the waste places of the fat one shall strangers eat. The next sin children of Israel were guilty of is using alcohol, drinking. In fact, some of those verses are found in Proverbs. The same ideas in Proverbs. The results are found in Genesis. We find the New Testament, which was written after this, but drinking. Now, some of you will say, well, Pastor, he says that, that you're, you're full of it, that there's a drunkenness aspect. He says that, but he also says you find wine at your feast, wine at the feast in, in, in verse number uh, 12. Why is it a big deal? Well, the New Testament says this, that I should not have something else be in control of me except the Holy Spirit. That nothing else in my life should have any, any touch of control in my life except God and his power. And we have Christians who still think it's okay to drink, to be drunk. Now let's talk about it for a minute. I did a whole series on this, and I bring it up because God mentioned it here. Look in the scripture. It is not what I'm making up. It's right here in verse 11 through 17. I'm not picking arbitrarily six sins to talk about tonight. They're right there in scripture, okay? So don't think I'm stepping on your toes because I don't like you. It's right there. It's number two. But isn't it funny, and I use the funny in the, in the, in the strangest sense of the word, isn't it funny how we reject culture until we want to justify our, our own actions? All right, that if I said, listen, uh, uh, you can marry a man if you're a man or a woman if you're a woman because culture says it's okay, you will say, Pastor, that's not right to the word of God. Right, right, you, you will argue that for me, will you not? If I talk about gender, listen, and if I were to say I'm not, but if I were to say, listen, you can decide your own gender, don't worry what God has done. You would say, Pastor, that's not true to the word of God. I'd say, well, culture says that. You'd say, Pastor, we can't follow culture, we must follow the word of God. Thank you. Someone's listening out here. Why is it when we come to alcohol, Christian, that we say, well, I'm not drunk, and, and everyone knows that the alcohol content of blood, blood alcohol is, is 0 0.08 or 0.8. And short of that, I'm not drunk. So why do we want to embrace culture to justify our actions when it's not convenient, we set it aside? Well, just one is okay. I can quit when I want to. You know, no one ever got in trouble by not drinking. Sir, have you abstained from alcohol tonight? Please get out of the vehicle. I didn't. I didn't drink anything. I've never been pulled over for drinking Diet Coke. I probably should have. <laughs> I haven't. Yet Christians, I'm talking about Christians, God's people, they argue for this. Well, one or two glasses, it's fine, of wine, and, and the alcohol content is different now. I've heard this before. They say, well, now that we refine alcohol differently, you do realize that people got drunk in the Bible. But even with a different style of fermentation, they still, mankind still figured out how to get someone really drunk. All right, read about Lot. Read about Noah. They figured it out. So don't talk to me about how it's different now. Sure, Lot's different now. We also drive in a vehicle now, and they had chariots back then. But they still got from point A to point B. And yet we have Christians who still argue for this. We got pastors who argue for this. It's a Christian right. 
I can promise you this, you'll never get drunk if you don't drink. I can promise you that. You will not get drunk if you don't drink. And yet, all of a sudden, we want to become our own judge in this. Well, I still feel fine after one glass. Though if you want to go back to culture, and when I did the alcohol series, that what the American Cancer Society says, that the optimal amount of alcohol consumption every day is 0%. So let me borrow from culture where they say it's zero. And they say even one glass of wine can impair vision and impair judgment. And God says, don't let anything control you except my spirit. You know, you want your life to be turned to dust? You want to manufacture dust, be a dust plant? Then just covet things. And number two, just let something other than God control you. And you let something other than God control you, and what you do will be worthless. Number three, 18 and 19, woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin, as it were, with a cart rope, that say, let him make speed and hasten his work, that we may see it, and let the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come, that we may know it. Number three, be careful when you begin to defy God. What a dangerous place. I hope no one is guilty of this in this, in this place tonight in a verbal sense. I would shudder to think if you look to the Holy One of Israel, the Holy One of God, to, to God and say, God, prove it. Show me. Now, there have been people that have said this to their own shame, reproach, and to their own judgment. And here the children of Israel were living in a way that said, fine, God said it, but it doesn't really matter. It won't happen. Understand God has said over and over again, judgment's coming, judgment's coming. And they lived their life in a way that said, whatever. And while we may not say, God, I defy you, maybe you're living in a way that says, God, I defy you. And living is just as bad as saying. It's not bad yet, so God, where are you? I guess working out okay. I'm living life my own way. And you know what? I'm doing all right. I got enough money in the bank, and my kids are nice to me, and, and people think they're respectful. I'm, I'm doing okay, God, and I didn't do your path. Careful. Careful. At that moment, you're nothing but a dust plant. And you're manufacturing decay and rottenness. Look at verse 20, please. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. What a sad verse. That someone would get up and say, something that is evil is good. And something that is good, evil. Yet we live in a culture that calls evil good and good evil. Do we not? They look to the word of God and say, if you say what the Bible says, that's considered hate speech. What is good is considered evil. And what is evil, what is wicked, is now considered to be good and normal. We, we live, and what, here's what's happening. What, what has happened is that they have perverted morality. All right, morality, right and wrong, they've perverted, they twisted it. And they've taken what is, what is proper and right and they've turned it around. And what is good, they call evil, evil, good. But this verse isn't written to culture. It's written to God's people. And God's not at this point speaking to culture. He does that throughout the Bible. But here he's speaking to God's people. And here he's saying, you, my people, my vineyard, my vine, the recipients of my blessings, you have called good evil and evil good. We got churches, we got pastors, we got ministries who call good evil and evil good. Do we not? This is the way we ought to worship, but it's not, it's not good. It's not good. We've got well-known evangelists who don't preach the word, preach prosperity. They call evil good and good evil. We've got ministries and they, and they, call what God calls an abomination and a lifestyle that is wrong and homosexuality and they say, you know what, that's all right. You can still be a pastor. And churches are doing this, calling good evil and evil good. Be careful when you call good evil and evil good because at that moment, you become a dust plant. 
It's not just in, in the churches and the pulpits. It happens in the pew. As you begin to justify your own lifestyle choices, you say, I can live in this lust. I can live in this adultery, this fornication, and it's good because I like it. Be careful when you call good evil, evil good. Not only is it covetousness and other control, defying God and perverting morality, look at verse 21. One of the most damaging accusations. Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. You want to become a manufacturer of dust in your life? Just begin to think that what you're doing is fine. Just begin to be your own judge and jury. Just begin to evaluate your own choices by yourself. Make your opinion the highest opinion. Well, I don't see anything wrong with it. Whoa. I don't feel bad about it. Whoa. What's wrong with be careful when you and I become our own judge rather than going back to God. God, what do you want? God, what's right with this? Lord, how do I honor you at the temple that you've, that you've saved me? I, I, I'm your temple. Lord, I want to please you. I don't want to be wise in my own eyes. I don't want to think all my things are prudent. I want you to weigh in. This one ought to walk all over us and stomp all over our life. Here's a question. How long can you live? How long can you live without Christ sustaining you? How long? Not one second, right? Not a half second. By him, all things consist. So if Jesus Christ let go, how long we live? None. Done. So then why do we think we can make life choices apart from him? We can't even live, we can't even breathe without the power of God in our life, yet we'll make choices, we'll make decisions, and it's what we logically reason through. This makes sense. It's good for my family. It's good for, it's good for my job. Where's God in the equation? Well, I, I prayed about it, and I felt that God. Now listen, God says he'll give you wisdom. We know that God reinforces his will in our life. One such way, he says, in multitude of counselors, there is safety. We're not called to be an island to, to ourselves. I, I will call people, and in essence, here's a question I ask. Listen, I'm going to bounce this off you. Let me know if I'm crazy. What I mean by that is, listen, I'm going to tell you something, and I want to make sure that I'm thinking correctly, because I can deceive me. All right? And James talks about that, that we can deceive ourselves. I don't want to trick myself. Because the minute I trick myself and I'm wise in my own eyes, guess what? I'm nothing but a dust plant. Because I can, I can go down every path and, and I can fully justify it and say, I, I felt this way and, I, and I, had, I had some peace about it. I can justify all that. But I want God's way in my life. I don't want to be self-sufficient. I want to be God-dependent. And last, verses 22 and 23 tonight. One of them that are mighty to drink a wine and men of strength to mingle strong drink, would justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. This last condemnation they had was one who misused influence. The leadership, they misused influence. They were in a place to, to, to call in situations and they misused influence. You know, all of us have influence. All of us have leadership. I don't care if you're old or young, uh, to a younger brother, younger sister, and vice versa. There are times that the young can influence the old. We all have influence. Then when we misuse that influence, then we are nothing but a dust plant. At the foot of Acropolis at Athens, there are still a few Corinthian pillars and these are all that remain of the once famous temple to Zeus. During Paul's day, they would have seen the temple to Zeus and everyone in Corinth knew and outside of Corinth knew about the temple to Zeus. It was beautiful. It was majestic. 
And now it's reduced to a pile of dust. They built this beautiful thing, but in reality, all they were doing is manufacturing dust. Only God himself, I'm sorry, God himself could not sink this ship. Said about the RMS Titanic. And God himself didn't have to sink the ship. He just used a little pile of ice. And now on the bottom of the ocean, there's a ship known as the Titanic, and it's reduced and decaying toward dust. And what they built was a beautiful yet worthless pile of dust. It's in Sicily. Nineteen oh eight, when a newspaper published a printed a parody against God, daring him to make himself known by sending an earthquake. And three days later, December twenty eighth, there was a terrible quake that killed eighty four thousand people. My friends, in our life, if we're not careful, we'll become a dust plant. What we are manufacturing, what we are working toward will be just rubbish, obnoxious to breathe, work to remove. Yet as we close, I want to remind you of one amazing truth from the word of God. Because God says this. Do you, do you remember back in verse 24 what happened? Why they're a dust plant? You remember what it had to do with the word of God? how they cast away, they, they turn their nose up. Remember this perhaps unfamiliar passage. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful, but his delight, his delight, his satisfaction his joy is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. My friends, it is like that this individual is at the buffet of God's word. And when you're at the buffet of God's word, they will not turn you away. You'll never be turned away. And you cannot eat enough of your fill at the buffet of God's word. His delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth its fruit in a season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. You see, there were those who turned away through covetousness, through self-sufficiency, through lack of control, through misused influence, and their life ended up with dust. Dust. Yet God says, if you cling to me, your life will prosper. And not just occasionally. The Bible in Psalm 1 says, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. So tonight, maybe you're a dust plant. Maybe you, as God spoke, he, you had to turn the light into your life and say, you know what, I've been manufacturing dust then turn back to God. Cling to his word, Psalm chapter 1, and let God prosper your life. That's the place we ought to be.